Hello, welcome back to Through the Trap Door. I'm Emily. And I'm Katie. And this is our podcast where we read you Harry Potter fan fiction. Woo! So we're on chapter 11 now? Yes, we're on chapter 11. A uh, quick recap of last week. Harry got in trouble with Snape. Uh, then Snape told Dumbledore. Uh, Dumbledore punished Harry, but not too badly. Yes. Just badly enough that it's annoying. Yep. And then Dumbledore announced that there was no more funding for Hogwarts. You know, because the Ministry thinks Dumbledore's a crack and that Voldemort's not back. When I don't know how long it's going to take them to realize, just trust goddamn Dumbledore because he doesn't really lie that often. He skates over the truth and hides the truth, but he doesn't lie. True. When he tells you something, it's true. Mm Mm-hmm. All right, chapter 11, The Death Curse. That's not ominous or anything. (laughs) (laughs) Ron was ecstatic when he found out about the Chudley Cannons playing in Hogsmeade. All the students seemed to be. Except there was to be one thing that spoiled the mood. That was their chaperone, was to be Professor Snape. I wonder why Dumbledore would choose old Snape to take us on a trip to Hogsmeade. He'll spoil it, Ron grumbled. Harry believed the same, but he had to agree that he would rather have Snape between him and a Death Eater than Sprout or Flitwick. Fair. Yeah. But also at the same time, Snape's kind of got to keep up appearances. True, but I feel like the Death Eaters know that, like, his job is to the students and, like... That's true. So they'd be, he'd be all be like... Mm-hmm. I think it's because he wants us to be safe, he reasoned while flipping through a page of extracting yourself from an animacula's web and other sticky situations. That is a fantastic book title. I would read that book. Ron just snorted. Then why not McGonagall? He started to scratch his parchment with a quill, but then stopped. Say, I know, it's you, isn't it? Me? Yes, it's because of you. If it weren't for you, we might have had someone else. Ron, that's enough. Hermione looked flustered. I'm sick and tired of how you've been acting. You try and start up an argument at every turn. Now stop it. Well, that does seem very Ron-like. It does. It's very reminiscent of uh, when he was mad at Harry in the fourth book for... Putting his name in the Goblet of Fire. Yeah, Ron, that was a real dick move of you not to believe your goddamn best friend. Why would he want that? He's already famous. He was also like, great, a year that's not about me. Mm -hmm. Fuck, a year about me. Yep. So you're against me now too? Well, that's just bloody fine. Be all chummy with Harry and leave me out of everything. No one ever thinks about me. At home, it's... Percy and Bill and Charlie, and here it's Harry Potter and Hermione Granger. Nobody ever stops and thinks about Ron until I complain, and then I'm told to shut my trap. Well, fine. He slammed his book shut and huffed up the spiral staircase. I mean, also kind of a fair argument. It really was. To all those in the common room who had been within earshot and watched Ron leave, they looked over at Harry. Ron! Hermione suddenly bolted from the table. She ran across Dean Thomas coming down the stairs. Excuse me, Hermione, but you can't go up there. Those are the boys. Just watch me, Hermione declared, pushing Dean aside. Also, not the first time she's been up there. Yeah, and girls can go up into the boys' dormitories. It's boys who can't go into the girls' dormitories. Harry couldn't hear any more after that, and he thought it was best not to follow... It wasn't until an hour had passed and it was time for Quidditch practice that he ventured upstairs to get his robes and put away his books. When he came into his room, Ron and Hermione were both seated on one of the beds, talking. They both hushed up when Harry entered. Quietly, he put his books away and once he grabbed his robes, turned to both of them. The whole common room is chattering, Hermione. You should probably come down soon. 
At this, they both grinned. What were they saying? Their grins turned into giggles. Harry had to smile, and then he scratched his head. Look, Harry, Hermione was nice enough to knock me aside the head and point out what a dunderhead I've been. I'm sorry. What? It sounds a lot like they made out. Yep. (laughs) Yep. Ron screwed up his face into a sincere, pleading look. I suppose I just get tired of always having to be in someone's shadow. Harry looked down at his quidditch robes. Ron, I really wanted to have you on the team, but I know. Ron punched him lightly on the shoulder. It wouldn't be fair. Besides, Fred and George promised to train me to become a beater. And personally, I'd rather be a beater than a keeper. Harry felt a wave of relief sweep over him. Ron was speaking to him again. So, you've still coming to see the Chudley Cannons tomorrow? I thought you were too angry about Snape coming, Harry pointed out. I am, he said firmly, but then put on his familiar grin. But I'd be hornswoggled, whatever that is. (laughs) Yeah. If I let that get ruin a Chudley game. I know we can sit behind him and throw cockroach clusters at his head. You all stay together and anyone caught wandering off will immediately lose 20 points from their house. Snape pointed his long nose at Fred and George. They both grinned and put a hand over their heart and spoke solemnly. You needn't worry about us, Professor. Snape didn't seem too convinced. Neither did Harry, for that matter. (laughs) Neither do I. (laughs) Nope, they're going to sneak off in a hot second. One good thing was that Professor LaSalle had come along. But he seemed just as excited about the game as the students, though he appeared to be more of a hindrance to his cousin than help. They were all seated in the bleachers, waiting for the game to begin. Snape looking sour and LaSalle munching from a bag of candy. Dumbledore must be angry at Snape to make him come out here, Ron thought aloud. No, Harry realized that he had never shared a certain bit of information. He told him to come because Snape used to play Quidditch. What? Snape used to play Quidditch? Fred and George had overheard. Ron and Hermione both looked shocked as well. I was shocked too. You've got to be kidding. Ron glanced over at Snape, looking baffled. Yep, he was on the Slytherin team, of course. Him and LaSalle were beaters. George laughed. I can definitely see LaSalle, but Snape... Hey, Weasley. Their attention was diverted to Draco Malfoy, sitting comfortably amongst a group of Slytherins seated by Professor LaSalle. What is it, Canary? Oops, I mean fair. Oh, no, I seem to have forgotten your name, Fred called back. (laughs) I love Fred. Draco turned very red at this. Watch it, you. I was speaking with your little brother. He was about to say more when Snape called out five points from Gryffindor Weasley for starting an argument. LaSalle stopped munching from his bag of candy, an expression crossing his face that clearly showed he saw the injustice that was dealt. I forgot to thank you, Dennis, he called out, for helping me clean that broom shed last week. I'm adding five points to Gryffindor. Snape turned around at this and looked startled, then angry. The Slytherins seated around him appeared the same. LaSalle took notice that he was suddenly, for a moment, unpopular among those nearest to him. Frizzing Wisbees, he offered, presenting the bag of candy to Snape. He offered it around to Draco and the others nearby, when Snape only curled his lip at the bag and faced the other way. I still don't know what to think of him, Hermione admitted quietly. Like how he hangs around with the Slytherins, yet lends a firebolt to Dennis Creevy? Was it ever determined to be jinxed? No, Harry shook his head. Their attention was shortly turned toward the game as the players entered the field. Ron and Harry shot up from their seats, waving little orange flags. There were decidedly more fans for the cannons than the steamers, whose colors were gray. Small gray flags waved as a smoking steam engine raced around the field, then disappeared. Next, a team of Magnus Mares rolled out a cannon onto the field while Fred and George began loud, humorous chant that actually caught the attention of one of the beaters 
who grinned and gave them a thumbs up. The booming voice of the announcer proclaimed that the game had begun and the chest containing the balls was unlatched. Harry nudged Ron as the beaters began to fly around after the bludgers. I want you to watch them. Learn some of the moves you can use next year. The game was going well for the Chudley Cannons, who were leading by 70 points after the first half hour. Harry had been swapping tips for beaters with Ron when a strange sensation crept over him. It started out as just goosebumps on the back of his neck and along his arms. But then it started. The deathly chill he feared so much. Dementors. I would just like to uh, question something real quick. I'm here. What's your question? At one point... In canon, didn't they talk about how the Chudley Cannons were, like, one of the actual worst teams? Yes, they were last in the league. Don't they always lose? Yes. Okay. I think they win every once in a while, but, like, not that. I feel like it's, like, they were losing, someone accidentally caught the snitch, but they're always last in the league. Yeah. They're, like, that team that maybe wins one or two games and it's like got a real strong fan base because people are like, you'll win someday. Yep. And then when they do win, it's like, yay, I told yay. you so. And then they're still last in the league and don't go to any of the playoff games. Yep. Okay. So maybe this is their like one game a year that they're going to win. Right. Because, you know, they're playing in Hogsmeade, which I guess must feel like home. Probably. It seems that way. Also, what do you think the official Quidditch season is? Because like the school plays it... The school has, like, six games. Yeah, which is stupid, but whatever. Like, they play it, like, during the school year. But, like, when do you think the actual Quidditch season is? Because I was just thinking, like, it doesn't make a lot of sense for them to be, like, flying around on brooms in a blizzard. But in Quidditch in school, it's clearly played during the winter. Mm -hmm. Because they play games in November. Yep. It just doesn't seem like a good game to be, like, flying around on a broom in... But the Quidditch World Cup is clearly very different than the games they're watching right now. Because the games they're watching right now are clearly regional teams. Mm -hmm. So I feel like what they're watching is more like like the B-list teams. Mm -hmm. Where like the Boston Bruins have the Providence Bruins. Which is like, if you get drafted to the Bruins, you're most likely going to the Providence Bruins first. You're not right on the Bruins team. Yeah, okay. Okay. I like your theory. We're going to continue on now. Clearly they weren't close. Not yet. No one else seemed to be affected, but he knew what it was. The game had been blocked out of his mind, and he focused over at where the Snape sat. They evidently realized something wasn't (coughs) right either. LaSalle had climbed up onto the top of the bleachers and was scanning out past the blissfully ignorant crowd. Snape had remained seated, but was no longer watching the game. Harry wondered if they knew it was a Dementor. Shakingly, he stood up and headed over to Professor Snape, receiving odd looks from his peers. What's wrong? Hermione asked. But Harry didn't answer. He had to use all of his strength and concentration left to weed his way through the the crowded bleachers. Snape took notice that he was approaching, and instead of the unpleasant look Harry had become accustomed to, he actually looked worried. Professor, Harry gasped. The cold was getting stronger and was beginning to constrict his throat. I know. Snape pulled him down. But we'll handle it, Potter. You stay here. Harry seemed to confirm what the Snapes feared, and Professor Snape stood up and joined LaSalle. You wouldn't happen to know what's going on, Harry asked Malfoy. I don't know what you're talking about, Malfoy replied, but he didn't sound entirely truthful. In fact, he looked nervous. Something that Harry didn't take to be a good sign. Harry squirmed in his seat, then held his head. His scar was beginning to hurt. His surroundings seemed to have completely vanished. The crowds, the announcer, the Quidditch players. Quietly, as if in the distance, he could hear his father's voice. Think of something happy, he told himself, as he fumbled for his wand. Ron, Ron and I are friends again, and Sirius and Lupin are back. I'll see them when this is all over. Tell them about the game. This helped a little, enough that he could focus on what was going on around him. There were screams, 
but they were beginning to dim. Harry! Harry! Someone was shaking him. We've got to go! It was Hermione. Potter! Now! said a much deeper voice. A firm hand grabbed him by the neck of the robes and hoisted him up. Envery! The voice mumbled, and suddenly Harry found himself staring at chaos. Students! Professor Snape bellowed. He was still gripping Harry's robes. Strangely, Harry noticed a strong smell coming from Snape's robes, and he tried to pinpoint it. Formaldehyde. Yes, there it was, but something else. Malfoy was running around, scared with the rest of the crowd, so he didn't take notice of Harry's predicament. All of you are to calm down now and follow Professor LaSalle back to the school. You'll only be safe if you stay with us. At once, Professor Lestaff raised his staff. The normally soft blue light grew in brilliance, casting blue a blue hue over all the students. It was strangely soothing. Now follow me, he ordered while lowering the staff. Earl Grey. That's what he smelled, Earl Grey tea. Snape dropped him into the crowd of students after this, he realized. Quietly, the students followed, finding that they didn't feel like talking and to panic seemed absurd. Whatever spell LaSalle had cast over them subdued their panic. Harry knew that Hermione would be looking up the spell as soon as they returned to school. Mm -hmm. LaSalle had sought out the head boy and girl who seemed to be leading the students once they got out of Hogsmeade. Evidently, he was going to stay behind and help Professor Snape get out of whatever trouble is headed his way. Harry was following at the rear of the crowd when he was struck with another bout of pain. He immediately brought his hand up to his scar and fell to his knees. Oh no, not again, Ron and Hermione began to pull him. But this wasn't the chill of the mentors. This was his scar burning. LaSalle noticed immediately. Miss Granger, you and Mr. Weasley get back to the school and get Dumbledore. Tell him we've got a problem. I don't think the Death Eaters have been summoned but I'm not sure what's going on. What about Harry? Hermione demanded. You just concentrate on getting Dumbledore. I'll see to Harry. Professor LaSalle then knelt down before Harry while Hermione and Ron took out running towards the school. At first, all that Harry noticed was that the pain began to recede. A soft, cooling sensation came to him, as if someone put a cool, wet rag to his forehead. He opened his eyes to see a deep blue, almost purple glow. That better? He looked into LaSalle's black eyes. They were so much like Snape's. It was uncanny. I need you to get up if you can. LaSalle was being very careful not to touch him. Though Harry could tell that he wanted to help, so he nodded and slowly rose to his feet on his own. Almost falling backwards, he was still unsteady. Now I'm going to need you to go back, but LaSalle didn't get to finish his sentence. Instead, he had stopped to look down the road. Snape was running as hard as he could towards them. What's Potter still doing here? He demanded while trying to catch his breath. His scar was hurting him, LaSalle informed. Snape's eyes widened. For a moment, he even looked afraid, but it quickly disappeared. He's not supposed to be here. He said, this looking back towards the village, evidently not meaning Harry. I know, and I still don't think he is. I would have known, unless he's on to us. At this, they both looked nervous. It got Harry feeling very afraid. He wanted to return to the safety of Hogwarts now. Can he cut you off? Snape asked importantly. Harry wondered what he meant as LaSalle shook his head. I'm pretty sure he can't, especially after that last concoction he served up for me. Then, can you tell if it's him? Harry found his own breath to be too loud as LaSalle silently stared down the dirt road. His eyes seemed to be looking deeper, not merely at the dirt, but into some unseen place. After what seemed like hours, he snapped out of this quiet trance. No, he's not here. But yet, he trailed off and looked towards town again. I sent some students to fetch Dumbledore, he said in a whisper. Harry, Snape said softly. 
while looking off in the opposite direction of his cousin, keeping an eye out should some de- dementors, or who knows what, appear. See those barrels over there? I need you to hide behind them. At first, Harry was taken aback by the fact that Snape had addressed him by his first name, but he wasted no time and followed Snape's advice and scuttled behind the barrels. How far are you from Hogwarts? Like, how far are you from the grounds that you were going to hide behind some barrels? Yeah, what? They sound like they're outside of town, but then, like, why would there be barrels outside of town? I'm really confused. Same, but it's all right. We're just, we're just gonna... Can't somebody just summon them a broom? And then Harry can just fly on over? <laughs> you would think. Also, why didn't someone send a Patronus to Dumbledore? We know that Snape can do that Patronus charm. No sooner had he had situated himself <coughs> in hiding than he felt the familiar chill pass through his body once again. He peered through the two barrels to see the Snapes were facing towards the town, tense and ready. Their acute sense of the Dementors had to be admired. He was actually relieved that Dumbledore had sent the Snapes in place of some of the other professors. Well, I feel like the Snapes were the right people to send just in case Death Eater showed up. Yep. They appeared silently, sweeping over the ground as dark shadows, their clammy gray hands poking out from under their heavy black robes. Harry couldn't stand it. He wanted so badly to conjure a Patronus and make them go away. He didn't understand why the Snapes just stood there, waiting as the Dementors kept coming. Do something, he whispered, as yet again the cold swept through him. Just when it seemed to become unbearable, he watched as LaSalle stepped forward, planted his staff firmly on the ground before him, and it began to glow. As the light became brighter, the coldness that had settled itself inside Harry began to diminish. The purple light seemed to have the power to melt away the iciness. For a brief time, the Dementors stopped, seemingly puzzled at what was before them, but it did not take long for them to move forward again. LaSalle threw a glance that Harry read as asking permission to do something. Snape nodded once, and LaSalle again faced forward. Slowly, the stone in his staff, while still holding the brilliant light, faded from purple to blue to green. Then he took a brave step forward. I am Salazar Snape, servant to Lord Voldemort, keeper of the staff of Ornkey, and I order you to turn back now. They stopped abruptly at this. It was becoming difficult for Harry to discern what exactly was happening for when the light of the staff had gone green the cold had returned with full force and it seemed to be tearing through his insides he wanted so much to watch but he bent over his knees and began to fight the urge to pass out the snapes would know how to handle a regime of dementors and he would gladly allow them to tackle the task without him Salazar's speech also had a cold effect. To hear the way in which he called out his position in Voldemort's closest circle made Harry think of the circles of Death Eaters that had stood around him, hanging over like a pack of vultures, ready to watch him die. He had to remind himself that he knew where Salazar's loyalties lay, with Dumbledore. Yet he still found him to be quite frightening. His whole countenance had taken on the resemblance of one of the stone gargoyles that sat perched at some of the highest points of Hogwarts Castle. He looked less the Hogwarts professor and more the frozen-hearted Death Eater. However, he did not seem to intimidate the Dementors to obey as they began to glide forward once more. "'Who's controlling them?' LaSalle exclaimed as he retreated to Severus's side. Where's Albus? Snape replied nastily. I don't know, but I say we take care of them now. The South sounded very firm. Without another word, they both looked behind them, most likely at one last hope to see if Dumbledore was on his way. And Snape raised his wand while LaSalle held up his staff. Harry strained to see, eager to see what Patronus Professor Snape would create. 
And not only that, but he wondered at what happy thoughts Snape could use to bring a strong enough Patronus to banish so many Dementors. However, that's not what he got to see. Snape took one last glance over his shoulder. Then him and LaSalle grasped each other's free hand and held it up. Trucendo in Contanum came Snape's voice loud and clear in such a tone that Harry felt like shrinking back as far as he could behind the barrels. At once, there was a blinding flash of light. It came from both Snape's wand and the stone in LaSalle's staff, then combined into one great stream of green light. The Dementors crouched and made a harrowing sound, unlike anything Harry could imagine. If it was possible for them to do so, it seemed like a scream of sheer terror, a scream that then disappeared as the light became so bright, Harry had to turn away. When the light dimmed and faded away, the chill from the Dementors had left as well. Cautiously, Harry peered around the barrel. What he saw strangled the breath from his throat. Where the Dementors had stood, now wafted smoke from piles of smoldering ash. Harry had always wondered what type of curses might lie in the screaming book he had picked up his first year when he entered the restricted section. And he had the strong feeling that it might have been one that the Snapes had just used. He began to wonder what Dumbledore's reaction would have been, but he didn't get the chance to ponder it for too long. A large hand unexpectedly reached out and pulled him from behind the barrels. Before he could do anything, there was a wand to his throat. Cornelius Fudge, what are you doing? Quite impressive, I must say. His voice was trembling, and Harry could feel that the minister was physically shaking, as he couldn't keep his wand steady. I never thought it was possible to get rid of so many Dementors at once. I must say, you too are fathomable. I only wish I knew where your loyalties lie. The way the two Snapes were approaching, it reminded Harry of the slither of a pair of cobras. Our loyalties, Fudge? I was just about to question yours, Snape said calmly. I thought it was just a ruse you're spying for Dumbledore, a way to cover your backsides like all the other Death Eaters. You two were too power-hungry to not follow Lord Voldemort. So, what is it you're trying to do? Snape asked wily. What am I trying to do? Fudge chortled. I am the Minister of Magic. What else do you think I'm doing but trying to keep the Ministry afloat? Mm, I don't think your job is to keep the Ministry afloat, but to keep the wider wizarding world afloat. But okay, yep. Fudge. Yep. You always did have image issues. Yep. And how do you propose to do that now that you've broken from Dumbledore? LaSalle challenged, continuing a step forward. I know what I'm doing. That's far enough. A step closer and the boy gets a good strong curse. What do you plan to do with Mr. Potter? Snape asked, holding his wand down at his side, but his knuckles were white from clenching him. This boy is a peace offering, Fudge explained. A peace offering? LaSalle exclaimed in such a tone that his voice squeaked on the last syllable. Yeah, the Salmi and you seem to have the same feelings right now. Lord Voldemort's going to win, no doubt about that. Fudge began to speak quickly, trying to hide the nervousness in his voice. And if he comes to power, there's no reason why the ministry can't continue under him. Sure, things will change, but I'm willing to cooperate. You're mad, utterly mad. LaSalle's staff began to glow a bright green. Lord Voldemort won't be persuaded with a peace offering. I'm warning you, Fudge jammed his wand deeper into Harry's throat. I'm going to take Mr. Potter here to Lord Voldemort himself. He'll see I'm willing to cooperate. At this, Harry felt his heart jump, but looking over at Professor LaSalle and Professor Snape, he knew they weren't about to let this happen. He just began to worry about what tactic they may use to stop Fudge. Fudge, meanwhile, began backing up around the building. He seemed to be inching towards a bucket, a porky, no doubt. Quietly, Harry began to damn the Dementors for making him so weak. He felt physically helpless at the moment, unable to break free from Fudge's grasp. 
Snape seemed to have had quite enough. Expelliarmus, he muttered, raising his wand quickly. There was a flash of red light, but Fudge successfully blocked it. Maybe I'll turn in two nasty little finks while I'm at it. He swore furiously as he reached out with his foot for the bucket. Harry Potter and the uncovering of two spies. That will be quite a gift. It was difficult to know exactly what happened next, but there was a flash of green light directed at Fudge, who instinctively pushed Harry in front of it. Pain immediately ripped through him. Harry felt this once before and had never wanted to experience it again. Despite Fudge's attempts to hold him up, he sank to the ground from the effects of the Cruciatus curse. Damn it! LaSalle screamed and the pain quickly left as it had come, leaving only a dull throbbing in its place. Salazar, stop! Harry heard Snape yell, but it was too late. There was a second flash of green light and a soft thump on the ground nearby and silence. Carefully, Harry rolled over and found himself staring into Fudge's blank, staring eyes. He was pale and still, just like Cedric Diggory that night in the graveyard. Whoa! Did one of them just kill Fudge? I think so. Ha damn! This is a great chapter. Yeah, it was! Katie seemed very overwhelmed. A lot just happened. <laughs> Fudge turned out to be evil, and... One of the Snapes just killed him. Well, I think Salazar just killed him. Probably. That's what I'm leaning towards. But Salazar could have totally just accidentally killed Harry. I mean, he didn't, but he could have. What if it was the killing curse... That hit Harry? And it felt like the Cruciatus because it actually was killing off the Horcrux inside him. Oh. But she wouldn't have known. True, she wouldn't have known that there was a Horcrux inside of Harry. We don't even know what Horcruxes are yet. I have so many questions. So many questions. Thank you so much for joining us on our journey through the trap door. Please leave us a review on Facebook or iTunes. It would literally mean the world to us. It really would. Uh, you can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Through the Trap Door 16 or on Twitter at The Trap Door. And please send us an email at through the trap door 16 at gmail.com with any story suggestions. And as always, join us again next Saturday as we travel through the trap door. Yeah.